Jesus, keep me. Thank you this morning for the invitation to come here. Uh, you have a beautiful sanctuary. I haven't been here before. Uh, and uh, it's lovely, and it honors God. <clears throat> I, would, I would like to just uh, talk to you this morning, but, uh, but my pride makes me give you an explanation. Um, I am as old as I look, but I'm not as old as I act. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I was cutting a limb out of a tree, 
And uh, I thought I knew what I was doing until the chainsaw went through the limb and the limb came back and knocked me off my ladder. Uh, so since then, I've uh, kind of crippled around a little bit, been a little bit sore. Uh, but no serious injuries other than my pride. I've taught physics for 30 years and I can't predict the torque of a tree limb. Uh, but you know, other than that, uh, I'm okay. Uh, some people have been asking, and trying to figure out who I am. Uh, and it's probably because after I graduated from high school, I just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth uh, from around independence. Uh, I went to college and wound up uh, right after college at a Christian school in Fort Scott, Kansas, uh, ran by Church God Holiness. And uh, I taught high school and junior high science for 30 years now. And uh, somewhere along the way, the Lord said, it's time for you to be principal in 2020. Uh, that was interesting. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's where I'm at these days. And uh, I, I look back over my life and I'm amazed at what God has done and uh, the direction and the things that have happened. Uh, also, somewhere along the way, pastored a little rural church for about 15 years. And uh, God's just, uh, he's very important to me and he's led me on an exciting journey. I have three kids that are all graduated, moved out, grown up, adult. Uh, my baby's older than I want to admit. Um, but anyway, uh, and even grandkids at this point in time. Uh, but enough about me. You uh, came to hear about God. There's this verse of scripture. Most of the scripture this morning will be out of 1 Kings, uh, neighborhood of 17 through 19. Uh, but there's a scripture in the book of James. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with it. James 5, 16 through 18. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, right away, you uh, probably noticed that my habit was not King James. I, for some reason, chose to start using New King James several years ago. So you might be more familiar with the phrase, uh, Elijah was a man with like passions. Or Elijah was a man that, he was just a man. He was just like you and I. That's an interesting statement right in there with what he was praying for. It sounds a little extraordinary to me. But James said again that he wasn't anything special. He was a man with a nature like ours or a man with like passions. He was just like us. So somewhere along the way, the Lord started bringing to my mind some different things about Elijah. And uh, this man that has a nature like mine. So I went back in 1 Kings, and that's where I'm going this morning, 1 Kings chapter 17. And I am skipping around a lot, and I will try not to, uh, to skip too fast if you are trying to follow along. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 Elijah shows up on the scene out of nowhere. And Elijah the Tisbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. I look at that and the first thing that comes to my mind is I can't relate. I can't identify with a man that's going to pray that it doesn't rain for three and a half years, and then holds a press conference with the leader of the country to tell everyone that it's not gonna rain. Now, I have confidence in my prayers, but not that much. Uh, I, I'm already saying, wait a minute, he was a man with a passion like mine? I, I don't identify there, I, I can't relate. Skipping down to verse 13 of the same chapter. Elijah is hungry in the middle of this drought. 
that he prayed that it would not rain. And there is famine everywhere because of that. And in verse 13, he goes to a widow and her son. And he says, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. I can't relate. I live in a women and children first mentality. And here's this man of God saying, fix me something first. This guy was, had like passions like me. Uh, I'm struggling here. I cannot relate to this guy. And then skipping down to verses 21 and 22, uh, a child passed away and he stretches himself out on his child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's son, a soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the, verse, the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived him. I really cannot relate. Now, for the last six years of my life, I've worked in EMS and I've done some CPR and a few things like that, but when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, you know, uh, here's this man of God that's bringing someone back to life. And James said he was a man with the passions like mine and I'm struggling because this doesn't sound like someone I can identify with. Wow. Then I'm going, and I, I apologize, I'm skipping quite a bit. Uh, going to 18th chapter, verse 19. He's in the middle of this relationship with the king here where he's telling him it's not going to rain. About three years have passed. And in verse 19, he's talking to the king and he says, Therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 <coughs> excuse me, and 400 prophets of Asheroth <coughs> who eat at Jezebel's table. He is challenging 850 people to a showdown. I cannot relate. Verse 24, he sets up the rules. Then call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So the people answered, it is well spoken. You know the story. You know what happened. They prayed and they did everything they could until the time of the evening offering and no one was there to pay attention. No one was there to listen because their gods are not real. Here's this guy in this confrontation, which is something I like to avoid, right with 800 people, one man against them all, and is saying God is going to answer by fire. And he prays a little prayer and by verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the book Kishon and executed them there. Can't relate can't identify if James says he was a man with a passion like ours. Verse 41, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Get up, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel and bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. He told the king it's going to rain, and he hadn't even started praying for rain yet. Struggling. Can't relate. Verse 44, and it came to pass that the seventh time, because he had to pray more than once on this occasion, he said, the servant said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And in verse 46, then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. You can tell by looking at me, I cannot identify with that. That could outrun a chariot. Wow. But he's a man with a passion just like mine, with a nature just like mine. First Kings chapter 19 now. 
first verse. And Ahab told Jezebel all that, the, that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And suddenly I can identify with someone that is discouraged, with someone that feels like everything that they've done has been in vain. And, you know, Lord, just get me out of here. You know, this is going the wrong direction. Culture's going the wrong direction. This, this, this is happening. And these people are making bad decisions. And this is happening. Lord, just get me out of here. I can't identify with Elijah on Mount Carmel, but I can identify with Elijah under the broom tree. Discouraged. Let's follow the story a little farther. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly the angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back to him a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, have torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. I can relate. Verse 11. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly... A voice came to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Then the Lord said to him, go and return on your way in the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael king over Syria. And you also shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshah, king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Manola. Sorry for those pronunciations. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And look at verse 18. And by the way, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouth have not kissed him. Elijah, you're not the only one. Wow. This morning, if, if the Lord would help us a little bit, I know there is a lot of scripture there. And uh, covered a lot of territory. And uh, sometimes I think a preacher can read too much. And I hope that didn't happen this morning. Do uh, you get the idea of, of what happened to Elijah? But there is in chapter 19, verse 3, an incredible phrase. Then Elijah, when he had saw that, he arose and ran for his life. What does it mean to run for your life? Or I title this this morning, Running on Empty. Now, don't tear this apart theologically, but I want to be up front and say there is a big difference between running for your life and running from God. That's two totally different things. One is a backslidden condition, and the other one is just running on empty. You do not have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. You're not victorious like the Sunday school lesson was talking about this morning. You're running on empty, and you're not doing what God wants you to do. 
you're not being effective at what you do because you are running on empty. That's a difficult situation to be in. It's a difficult situ situation to recognize. But that's the first thing we have to do when we're in that condition is recognize that we are not as effective as we should be, that we are relying on our own strength. We are doing things that have no purpose. When we are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit can take what we do and use it to glorify and to edify others around us. But when we are doing things on our own, we are not accomplishing the purpose that God asks us to do. And I'm, I'm kind of mixing two points together here this morning. But when we are running on empty, the reality is people are hurt by our behavior because we are operating outside of the Spirit's influence. Let me try to, to illustrate that this morning. Uh, the last six years, I have worked for EMS, um, which is a fancy name for ambulance driver. Um, and we have this book, it's called Protocols, and we need to be familiar with that book, and we are tested over it, supposedly, once a year. Um, but that's very important, because if we are taking care of a patient and we do not follow protocol, we personally are liable. If we are doing everything that is in the protocol, our agency stands behind us and there's legal protection because we are following the book and doing what we're supposed to be doing. But when we operate beyond that scope or we fail to do everything that we're supposed to do that is in our protocol, we are liable. We are in trouble. I'm trying to say this morning that when we are running on empty, we are operating in a way that the Holy Spirit cannot always take what we do and use it for God's glory. We're operating beyond the scope of influence or beyond the sphere of influence of the Holy Spirit, if this makes sense this morning, and we are doing things that the devil can take and use in a wrong way. I'm confident that in my life I have said things that the devil has taken and used to hurt and to harm other people. I didn't intentionally do it that way, but I wasn't, the spirit didn't have control of my mouth and my mind to the point where he couldn't put his stamp of approval on what I said. And as opposed, and because of that, people were hurt. Um, like driving down here this morning, uh, went past, especially in Kansas, several fields of corn, and uh, they're looking good and healthy and tall, but there's some right along the edge. Maybe there was standing water for a while. And they're only about two feet tall. They're still green. They're still alive. But their growth is stunted, and they're never going to bear much fruit. And sometimes I wonder if there are people that I have had influence on that because I was running on empty and I said something, that the devil was able to twist around and it drove them away from God. It didn't destroy them, it just stunted their growth to where they will never reach the potential that they could have if they'd have been in, if I would have been in a different situation. I know we are all responsible for our own choices, but this morning when we are doing things, we can do some incredible things when we're running on empty but not accomplish anything because God cannot bless it and cannot use it for his glory. I, for several years, drove a 15-passenger van. And uh, one day, I came up to the top of a hill just south of Fort Scott and uh, had some kids on there. I was hauling home, and I looked at the gas gauge, and I thought, that's not good. Uh, I better head back in town. So I turned, and just as I pulled out onto the road and gave it a little bit of gas. I heard a little popping noise, didn't think that much about it. It died, and I said, wow, that was close. I coasted downhill. It was one of those times where the stoplight was green and there wasn't any traffic. I coasted through that stoplight. A block later, there was another stoplight. It turned green before I got there. I coasted through that. I got in the center lane. There was no traffic coming. I turned and coasted into Casey's right up to the gas pump. 
incredible momentum. But guess what? That was all for nothing. The uh, rotor and the distributor had broken. And no matter how much gas I put in there, that van was never going to run again until someone fixed a part in it. So all of my incredible efforts had no lasting value. And I think sometimes I've been that way in the classroom. I've tried to say things on my own. I've tried to teach things on my own and operated beyond the Spirit's protocols. And it's been for nothing. But then there's other times when the Spirit of God is operating in your life and you don't even realize that you do something that he can use for his glory. I remember one time, this has been several years ago after graduation, I was going around talking to the different seniors and uh, this girl Valerie said, Mr. D, my favorite teacher. And I was like, yeah, sure. You tell that to everyone, stops by. And she's like, no, I really mean that. You are my favorite teacher. And I'm like, in my mind, I, I, I said, why is that? And then in my mind, about a hundred things ran through before she could answer. I was thinking, surely it's that, that time in, in biology when we had that fantastic lab, or maybe it was that explosion we did in chemistry, or maybe it's anatomy and physiology trip to see the cadavers. You know, I went through this long list of things that I'm sure made me her favorite teacher. And she goes, well, one day, I was having a bad day, and you noticed. You put your hand on my shoulder, and you said, it's going to get better. And she said, it did, and I always remembered that hand on my shoulder and your words of encouragement. I had no idea. But when we are not running on empty, when we are enjoying the fullness of God's spirit, God can take every little thing we do and use for his glory. He can use to, to change other people's lives. He can use it because we are operating under the Spirit's control. But when we're running on empty, those things don't happen. Instead, we end up hurting people instead of helping. Why this morning would someone, what are the reasons for running on empty? Well, I look at Elijah, I can tell why he's running on empty. He is physically exhausted. Why do I say that? So. You know, why am I so confident there? Because God fed him and let him sleep and it woke him up and fed him and let him sleep. God realized he was physically exhausted and he needed nourishment and rest. And we can push ourselves to the point and operate on our own to the point that we are physically exhausted and we become empty and lose our effectiveness in this work that we are doing. When I use that term, uh, lose our effectiveness. I remember another story, uh, and this had been in Elisha's day, and uh, August Lelf preaching about that man that was chopping down the trees and his axe head went in the water. And August Lelf said, you know what he did? He stopped chopping. He didn't keep beating the tree with a stick. He stopped chopping. And when we lose our effectiveness, that's what we need to do. We need to stop and find out what's going on in our lives. Sometimes we can be running on empty because we are broken, because of circumstances that we have gone through and we have possibly chosen uh, not to accept God's grace in situations and we become broken and discouraged and we're just running on empty. Well, what can you expect this morning if you're running on empty? Number one, you can expect renewal. Um, before God ever spoke to Elijah, he gave him food and rest two times. And God's food lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It wasn't Chinese. He wasn't hungry 30 minutes later. He lasted for 40 days. That's awesome. It was the strength that he needed. God will renew us. And then there's the revelation. God revealed himself to Elijah. Before he told Elijah, get out there and get back to doing what you're supposed to be doing, First, God has this little session where he sends the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. You know, everyone close to Mount Carmel saw the fire. But only Elijah saw the wind and the earthquake. And only Elijah heard the display or heard the still small voice. 
God reveals his strength to us when we need it the most. When we, oftentimes, when we are discouraged, that's when God shows us how powerful he is. And God can work in our lives in an incredible way when we are going through a storm mentally and physically. That's when we see God's power. That's when the disciples saw the strength of Jesus is when he stilled the storm. Yeah, they, they saw some strength on Mount of Transfiguration but they experienced the stilling of the storm and they experienced the power of Almighty God when they're out there in a boat in the middle of the storm. When we are discouraged, oftentimes God reveals himself to us personally in a way that no one else knows about. God just touches us and said, I can do this for you. I can do this for you. Choose grace. Choose to rely on my power. In those times he reminds us, that we are not alone. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it doesn't matter how discouraged we get, God is still with us and he's still there and we just need to look for him. Look for him. Was God in the earthquake and the fire and the, the wind? No, it was just God's power. But God was in the still small voice that spoke to Elijah. And God can speak to our hearts in such a way that he needs that we need him too. Yes, when we are running on empty, we can expect renewal, we can expect, expect revelation, and we can expect him to re-engage us. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? The battle's over there, and that's where you need to be. And by the way, Elijah, your work's not over. You need to do this, 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 and this. There's still a job for you to do. Just because you're discouraged doesn't mean your usefulness is over. I still have work for you to do. And then he reminded Elijah again, by the way, you're not the only one. There's still 7,000 people that have not bowed their knee to you. Back to your position. The battle is not over. There's still work for you to do. He reengages us in the battle. If you're running on empty this morning, that's what to expect. You expect him to renew your strength, to reveal himself to you, and to be reminded of who he is and re-engaged in the battle. But what if this morning, if it's a different situation, what if you are running from God? You have intentionally done something that you knew was not right, it was wrong, and you've turned your back on God and you've ran from him. There's a couple of incredible verses, and one of them is Isaiah 55, 7, a verse that everyone needs to memorize. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that awesome? If you're running from God this morning, the first thing you need to do is stop running. Forsake your way. Stop. Take a different route. And the unrighteous man is thoughts. Don't go down that road anymore. Stop. And then return to the Lord. And you say, well, you don't know how far I've ran. I can't get back. To return to him is the journey's too great. I can't do that. I've ran too long. In, verse, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is talking about the good shepherd. And he said, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, and again, I think of August Lelf, he says, Do you ever wonder why you got saved so easy? He said, it's right there. He lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and heads back to the fold. August Lelf said, he doesn't tie a rope onto your leg and drag you back. No. He puts you on his shoulder and takes you back. If you've been running from him this morning and you stop and you repent, you can expect God to pick you up and bring you back. And what else can you expect? You can expect restoration. It says, return to our God, for he will have mercy. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Not just partially, 
but God will restore. God will give us abundant pardon. This morning, if you're running from God, stop, repent, expect him to help you return and expect him to restore you with his abundant pardon. I'm thankful for a God this morning that loves us regardless, that loves us no matter what. And yeah, Elijah was a man, just like we are. He got discouraged. He had some bad days. But it was in those times when he found out how great God was. And today, if you're going through a difficult time, hang in there. There's a God that specializes in helping people that are running on empty. And if you're running from him this morning, stop. Let him return you. Repent and let him return you. And he will have mercy. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon.